Greetings and welcome back to the Go Global World 5-Minute Podcast. And just a disclaimer, guys, this is going to be way more than five minutes today. So you get to hear a little bit from me and a little bit from the refreshing accent of the dude that literally allows me to do this every single day and either provide you guys with useful information or take up blocks of your time that probably should not have either or, right? There's a yin and there's a yang to everything. So going over everything before, right, we're the digital Silicon Valley that gives you whether you're just a listener, founder, investor, advisor, current market trends, tips and tricks for your business and business practices in this ever-changing world. So um, I think we'll just dive right in, right? And I'm, I'm literally talking to one of the founders, if not the founding member with a way cooler accent than mine. So what, so what we're going to cover today What is Go Global World and what makes it different than other venture capital ecosystems? You're talking to a dude that's in a lot, and this one's different for a few reasons. What what they're hoping to accomplish and just a little motivational piece about current state of VC and how to break into VC. and Just a little bit of my personal story and a little bit of Daniil's personal story. So. I'm not going to I'm not going to introduce this person because this dude's so cool. And I think that's disrespectful of a person of high regard for somebody else to introduce them. So I will let Daniil introduce himself. Thanks, Chris. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. And I think you're doing such a great job explaining people in five minutes. Great stuff. And uh, I am actually uh, trying to keep up with your podcast because, I mean, the news you are sharing is amazing. About myself, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I screwed up my first company, so I'm proud for that. And uh, um, it's still painful, but uh, uh, I learned uh, to do business uh, uh, the hard way, making a lot of mistakes. And uh, so right now, what I'm building is the digital Silicon Valley ecosystem for founders, investors, and advisors. And uh, where founders are getting access to know uh, to uh, uh, knowledge of how to start and scale a company, access to network of founders and investors, and access to opportunity to fundraise through our matching app and through our different pitching programs. It's just the entire ecosystem where we believe that everyone should have equal access to opportunities to build and scale their companies from where they are. They don't have to be in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is global, digital. Why would you go to the territory where that's the mindset of people helping each other? But for investors, this is the other thing. Uh, what uh, what I think uh, we're trying to build is the uh, access to the deal flow, not from the territory they are surrounded, but from around the world, where laser focused, the best founders they can find exactly uh, to the thesis they're trying to uh, share with the world where they invest and uh, that, but it's not stopping in there. So the ecosystem means that you can meet other investors as well. So investors meet investors, so they can share deal flow. They can lead investments and invite other investors to join their deals. Um, and they find LPs. There's so much uh, uh, they can do. But most importantly, what I want is to uh, have verified people, meeting verified people in a safe environment where we have the rules of supporting each other. We are building digital Silicon Valley as the platform and the app. And that's just part of my life. That's probably part of my story as well, because I uh, not only entrepreneur or an investor, I teach at business schools how to do business and uh, I have natural passion of solving this problem. I, uh, I'm not in, in love with the product. I'm in love with your problem. And uh, if you would give me as much feedback as possible to make this place better, we will make this place uh, better for all of us. Yeah. And uh, before I kind of dive into the probing questions, guys, there's a huge difference for those of you listening that con- con- confuse deal sourcing, which is very shallow and in my opinion, very useless compared to deal flow, which is actually completing the process, the stuff, the back end stuff that people don't see, the due diligence, the, hey, is this just an LP uh, general partner or sorry, LP limited partner or general partner? Are these just a bunch of rich guys with money that don't know what they're doing? Or is this actually something in the sale? Now, if you can get that in a community, I'm in a lot of them. And like I said, right, this one is different in my personal opinion. I discovered this community through a separate Discord. My buddy, Luke, who runs Venture Network, also a very good one. 
but a lot of people shy away from people actually pitching and collaborating in discords, labeling it or freaking telegram or anything, labeling it as spamming your channel. Now, if you were to do this in person, you would, you wouldn't be saying all that you'd be collaborating. What's the difference between doing that and actually doing it digitally? I never understood that. But I know this didn't happen overnight, Danil. I know because your Telegram is full of thousands and mm. thousands of very smart people. And as soon as I entered, because I have a big network myself, but I believe in reciprocity and helping people out. There's a few people that needed help being passed off in the sports tech realm. And, uh, you know, that's that's what our community is about. How how do you, how did you build this community to where it's at? And how did you get everybody on board to have what's called shared understanding and that's a common term that never left me from the army if everybody's on the same sheet of music then that's how you build a community because you can be in a lot of garbage communities i'm in a few myself that i keep exiting yeah uh well uh you know you 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 dive into the biggest problem i had and uh, i've made so many many mistakes building this is exactly the community we started uh, right before COVID. Uh, I was thinking of this idea for quite some time because I always wanted to match investors and advisors. And I wanted to create this digital ecosystem because I already was surrounded with many people I supported with my expertise. And so it just naturally happened. But this happened in a funny way because uh, I was speaking a lot uh, at different uh, conferences uh, and events. Uh, and uh, at one event, uh, I just uh, thought like, oh, there has to be something I need to announce. It's just five or 15 minutes before the event where I was supposed to speak, just before 15 minutes of my speech, I created a, a group and uh, announced it on my slide that this is a Go Global World um, community. And after 30 minutes, uh, after uh, my talk, I, I got about 30, 40 people right in my... <laughs> Uh, my chat and so like I, I gotta do something with that <laughs> that's how it started but then uh, um, there was like uh, growth fall growth fall and uh, um, my uh, challenge was that I'm not American born but I'm a founder an immigrant and so um, uh, everybody everyone can hear my accent so uh, and uh, everyone is thinking that uh, because I speak so, uh, some other languages like such as Russian, so uh, they were thinking that we are like Russian community. We are not. We are US-based global community. And uh, we are just giving entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs from around the world access to this by verifying every single person. So we were not growing fast, but we were verifying every single person. And what I noticed is that, yes, it takes a lot of time. But nobody want to leave the community because we have such a great folks helping each other, such a good network. And if you don't know even what you get exactly right now, you still don't want to leave because this is the network you try to get. And it's really hard to get this network. So this network is not local, it's global. And right now we have about 40 ambassadors in 30 countries that are representing us. So with our 3000 members right now, uh, if you multiply by just basic statistic, every person should have about 150, 170 people in their close reach, uh, like of quality network. If you multiply it by 3,000, it's half a million of people around the world. You get through our community through one handshake already now of verified people. That's just crazy. And uh, that's the quality you get already here. And yeah, guys, kind of going to the kind of nurturing of your network, right? So your your network's only good if you can continuously nurture it. And everybody kind of makes the assumption like, hey, you know, if this startup isn't raising right now, I probably shouldn't talk to them. That's false, right? You're going to have market influx. And if you guys have not been paying attention with what's going to Silicon Valley Bank, you probably should just hop on Google real quick because you're going to see a lot of things. And an after effect of that one incident, and I'm just going to say this one incident, but in America alone, 50% of startups within the next, I don't know, 90, 120 days are going to be looking to raise. And most likely due to market correction, that's going to result in down rounds. You know, it's only possible that all things get he get healthy. But that one interjection of capital, whether it be bridge rounds or safe notes for when the market comes down, that's going to come from your network. Startups that that didn't have to raise before Silicon Valley Bank, which I feel for everybody, are going to have to raise now. So then you can go into communities like this one and then you can either get the expertise and not just for raising, right? You want to talk to subject matter experts, people that have 
been through it before. Because what if your problem doesn't have to result in a capital raise? You can still come back to this community and then maybe two years down the line when you want to raise for the next round, the next challenge, Series A, get, get product market fit. You have the expertise. And this also eliminates the fact, I don't know why everybody says in order to be successful, you have to go to every in-person startup networking event. I'm like, yeah, I've been to a few. I live next to the Houston Ion, but is that the best use of your time where you can be doing other things? Um, I don't think so. So I guess with that going into place, like where where do you see Go Global World 5, 10 years out? Well, um, uh, great question. Uh, so first of all, um, we want to change the industry uh, we want to unite every single hub of like local Silicon Valleys around the world into one space. We want to become uh, um, uh, not a competitive community to others. We want to be uniting uh, for people creating innovation, for investors trying to find uh, their uh, new deal flow uh, to invest. And uh, we want to be a place where people trust each other. So. That's why uh, in five, 10 years from now, um, I see that this is like a single platform with thousands of maybe hundreds of thousands of people or more, which uh, can find each other in a, such an easy and fast way with their laser focus criteria of exactly solving their problem. For example, right now we have built a matching app that's exactly started doing like that. So we, uh, the industry is screwed, this uh, technology industry is screwed with the hundreds of cra crazy criteria every single investor is having. Startups are spamming them with uh, their pitch decks. So people are wasting a lot of time on irrelevant people. We want to solve this. We want to be standard in the industry of finding the right people to invest in or the right people uh, to find uh, like, the, the right investors to, to connect with. And uh, the system should automatically and with the effort of our team verify by all the necessary uh, criteria, so you know that you are finding the right person. So the from five, the five, 10 years from now, we want uh, startups to raise capital fast and easy uh, as possible without uh, dumb limitations that we have created as humankind in this industry because it's innovative uh, industry and uh, this has to be like smart people should have access to capital full stop and the uh, the people who invest they get a lot of um, great deal flow so they don't, don't take as much risk uh, as now yeah and like that's that's great when you can have like multiple niches and the overall market map of any industry in one place that takes a lot of time away from you actually doing more of what's called desktop research, right? Because it's always good to have like the product right in front of you. Other, other people that's done it before, I think experiential learning is the best type of learning. And if that's in a one-stop shop place and not just on the internet, I mean, I could read about that, but if I, if I can't talk to a founder or a subject matter expert that's had the growing pains, especially things like Web3, like it's changing every single day. Like even that now they're talking about having competitors for chat GPT-4 and that literally just dropped what yesterday? I'm just like, okay, that's cool. And now you have people writing books with it and sending emails with it. And now schools want to ban it. So like, it's just little things, very tiny things that change every, every day. You need to have the people in the trenches. And I guess I'll kind of just go over to, I guess, how to break into VC, I guess, well, I guess I'll let Daniil kind of talk his piece because he has the most direct way and the most efficient way to do it, you know, be a founder, make the mistakes, and now you're in the ecosystem. And then I'll just kind of go into how I'm kind of navigating that route as well. Well, competition for capital ended up to uh, uh, have an importance, not only the access to money uh, from the investors, of course, but uh, also what you really can do for a startup. And uh, um, one thing is great founders are looking for, not just any founder, but great founders are looking for uh, so-called uh, smart money. But in fact, what do you really can help with to your founders you want to invest in? Are you really the one who can support them from 
pre-seed round to seed round and up to series A through your connections, through your expertise, through the network of other investors or corporations uh, that could be uh, access to capital or access to customers. Like uh, you have to be not just the money. I mean, money are important, but most importantly, are you the, the right person to accelerate their growth? So when you put their, uh, the money and you join uh, with your network, uh, that's like putting um, fuel on the fire. The, is this the story about that or is it just the money? And uh, if we are talking just the money, uh, it's not enough right now. You have to be the person of solving uh, uh, the problems of startups that they cannot solve because they don't have enough access to network or expertise or something. Of course, you would say it's the founder's job but you are the one to improving them, helping them, not uh, becoming the barrier for like doing something uh, instead of them. Uh, it's just creating them an opportunity. And uh, breaking into VCs is the all about your reputation. So uh, as investors would also look like at you if you want to create your fund, what deals did you have? How many founders did you help? What it ended up uh, like as a result, like, did you invest your own money and how did it uh, happen? Like, did you, uh, uh, did you invest together with other investors? So <laughs> it, it, as with startups and with investors, it's all about creating your network, uh, creating your reputation and your history of your success and failures. Failure is not a bad thing, but if you have your reputation very strong, so uh, having your reputation strong you have to be in the network of other investors as well and try to collaborate with them. So maybe you're not investing right now uh, if you even have the money. What can you do? You can find the right startups. You can bring these startups to investors in your network as, and share with them an exclusive, exclusive deal so they can invest. And they will be happy to invest in that if they see potential. And then they will look at you even more serious because you brought them something that others didn't. And this is how the connections are becoming stronger. So the network of verified people where you help first and uh, then they will be so happy to go back and help you. And uh, creating a fund is always a, the first fund is always a challenge. So I would be honest saying that I never created my own fund. I have a lot of people in my network who have created the fund. So I'll be talking not from my experience, but from uh, their experience, what I see. Uh, and they, uh, they emphasize a lot on creating a small fund, maybe syndicate uh, before they creating a fund. So to show first successes, uh, successfully invest in the right startups. We are the network to find the right startups. We are the network of finding the right investors. So you would find the right deal flow, find co-investors, and maybe make a few deals and show the results in future, like when you raise another, sorry, another um, syndicate or a, a small fund. So you need a track record, reputation, and the network. That's the key things that could create you uh, as a successful investors and break into VC. Absolutely. And as I've like stated numerous times, I believe that, you know, starting a venture capital fund, like it's a unique asset class, but those do fail. It's just that the news doesn't highlight it nearly as much because it's a very, a lot of people use debt financing, which that's a very controversial topic right now, but I'm not going to dive into that, into that topic because I have a lot of friends that work at the bank that I'm referencing, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, there's a progression to everything, right? You go syndicate, then you go fund one, fund two, fund three. And like, it's very rare somebody makes it like the fund four, fund five because of the intricacies, paying back, uh, paying back management fees and all that other stuff. So that type of vehicle can fail. People just don't talk about it nearly as much. And guys, I kind of go into my story because maybe this could inspire you or maybe you're going to be like, how did this dude end up here? And mm -hmm. it's going to go in a zigzag, but here we go, right? So I'm Chris. I'm from the very unexciting part of the U United States called Ocean City, Maryland. It's all cornfields and swamps. You know, I'm nobody special on paper. I was pre-diabetic growing up. I am a first-generation college student raised by a single mom. Luckily, you know, I found sports. I did five years in the military as an officer in El Paso, Texas. That changed my life forever, especially going through 
COVID, the Mexican refugee crisis, Syrian refugee crisis. I got to be on Team USA and see and see the world for a little bit while I was in the military. And how I kind of even, you know, stumbled onto VC. Like, I thought it was just this very fictitious content that Gary V would talk about. I'm like, okay, why don't a lot of people just stay lean? And I realized, oh, okay. Like the stuff you see in space, you, you know, sometimes you're going to need a lot of capital for that that you kind of can't get from a bank. But I went to an event in Austin, Texas called the Veterans of Tech Summit, and they still have it. And I'm hoping one day to speak at it because I think it's great. I saw a lot of former military managing directors, founders, all these people that like didn't have some sort of fancy degree or something, absolutely killing it in the dual use space, in the sports tech space, whatever you name it. So I aspired to be like that. I thought I was going to get into technical project management outside of the military. I was trying to decide what I, uh, what I was going to do. And everything kind of has their twist and turn. So I decided, okay, you know, I'm going to keep exercising my network being of use. I was in business school until recently. I found out that my uncle got into this pretty tragic car accident, but luckily he's fine. But due to my network, you know, I just want to, I'm still seeking, this is month two, and everything's great financially. I'm just, I'm just a huge proponent of, you got to try and be in a place where, where you think that you belong. You know, life is too short. Everything's changing right now. To be in a place that you think that you cannot be of value or of prosper. And I don't know how many times I got offers from Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and all these other people to come work in FPNA, but I've built such a large network of people that I want to help all across the world, 3X capital places in Saudi Arabia. I've learned all this stuff that I'm not willing to give this up yet. And I personally believe God will tell me uh, aggressively when it's time to pivot. And I keep meeting good people like this and like Jamie Messler and anybody from Andreessen Horowitz. So anybody that's kind of in a rut right now and that can be not just from a financial side or startups or anything like that you know you got to look at failure as what the acronym is it's the first attempt at learning maybe you didn't hit your kpis for life for this week whatever that is you know miles ran of uh, annual recurring revenue you know ev everybody has a guideline that they that they live their lives by but what I can tell you is that you need to be surrounded by the people that inspire you and, and motivate you. You need to always be building your network. And this just isn't in startups, right? I think I have mentors in a lot of facets of my life. I have a financial advisor. I still have a strength coach that I talk to, even though I haven't done anything since Worlds. I have a weekly Bible study that I go to. I have people that tell me how to make TikToks better and will tell me aggressively when they are horrible. And I've gotten a few of those today, actually. So it's just all about, I think that people tend to gravitate towards things that everybody wants to do things the same, you know, like, I think that venture capital is cool, because you don't see the reward until the very end. I run 30 miles a week, because I don't get to see the reward of me getting faster until the end of the year. Same thing with weightlifting. I I look at stock sometimes because I know that that stuff and like it's the same thing. People tend to gravitate and do things that are more towards their habitual patterns. And some people like quick money. Some people day trade. Some people jump off skyscrapers for the Internet. You know, it's just all those type of things. So if anybody out there is feeling lost, just know that in order to get into some industries, maybe you don't need a Harvard MBA or anything like that. And one day I'm hoping to get my MBA because I am a first generation college student, I'm probably doing it online now. I did just fine in my first semester, but soft skills cannot be taught. That's something that you have to go out there. Sometimes you have to mess up being socially aware you know, I know that I have a very, people have told me I have a very aggressive face naturally, but I was very intimidated when I first talked to Daniil. I thought this dude was going to beat me up or something, but no, he just said, Hey, you know, I really want this podcast to happen. I'm like, Hey, former content creator, I can do this for you in, in exchange for just leveraging the network. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like we're saying before, right? Value creation, you give somebody something of value. And then that's what starts turning heads. And from the venture capital side, in these past 60 days, and anybody that follows me on LinkedIn, you know, whenever I help close a deal, I normally list them and thank them with their permission. 
In fact, I think tomorrow I'll be posting about a women's sports betting app that's uh, the end of Lead Sports. So you you got to make yourself of use. And, you know, time is your most beautiful commodity. And uh, I don't know if that was an inspirational piece to anybody, but just know that life's not meant to be linear. I am a late stage finance dude. I, did, I didn't even know what a balance sheet was until like a year ago. So I think anybody can do it. I think <laughs> you don't need uh, uh, an MBA, frankly. Uh, uh, you, I, I, this is the guy who has two MBAs. Uh, <laughs> from and, where? Uh, uh, one is from uh, uh, my home country and the other from the US, from California, Lincoln University. And I studied a little bit at Stanford uh, as well, at entrepreneurial class. And you know, you know uh, entrepreneurship is the best uh, business university you ever uh, create for yourself because the universities are good at some, for some extent. And then uh, having three degrees, I can say that the best education I get from my customers. They are like screwing me up on everything I'm trying to do. And uh, uh, I always find a way to make them happy, to make my business growing. And uh, this is the best ever business school we have created for humanities, running the business, uh, making happy your customers. That's, uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't advise anything uh, else better than that. So MBA is good for some extent. You can read, you can watch the courses, but in the end, uh, if you have practical experience, the results, the failures, that's the best what you can learn from. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think you are really great uh, as a podcaster. So I, I totally disagree with you. People uh, could be afraid of your face or something. No, you're doing great, man. I love your podcasts. I like really listening into them on Spotify. Like, wow, this is so awesome. Like in five minutes, you can explain something I could explain in 15 maybe or so. <laughs> So I get the inspiration from a podcast I listen to on my daily run still every single day. And I'm not nearly, if anybody out there thinks that I'm okay, I will never say that I'm good at anything because there's always room for improvement. But you guys need to listen to, especially my US people, uh, Wall Street Breakfast, anything, any market they could explain in five minutes. And I am still perplexed about how they can take a complex concept. If you don't believe me, listen to their Silicon Valley Bank episode. They took that whole tragic incident and condensed it in five minutes. And I was like, wow, they didn't skip a beat whatsoever. And I that was just kind of like my inspiration for the podcast. So here we are today. And then as, um, as I kind of settle into... My full-time role, whatever that is, I'm hoping to add more audio video. I get very inspired by people around me. We got Joe. I live in Houston. We got Joe Rogan two hours south of me. And I'm just like, that That dude knows how to take a three-hour podcast and keep people engaged. Normally, I would never listen to that. But yeah, he's just really good at what he does. And uh, yeah, guys, as we're kind of just rounding out, um, I'll kind of just give you guys like some advice on my end about just how to navigate this weird life that we're in right now and I, and I think you know i think we can tack on some time to talk about silicon valley the bank just for a little bit i kind of want to get that off my chest but anybody that's in a rut here right just remember your alignments determine your assignments right who you're around what you're consuming physically mentally all that other stuff i firmly believe that greatness can happen at any time Anybody has access to the internet for the most part. I don't want to be ignorant to third world countries, but I'm just saying anybody that's trying to be progressive. But spend less time doing stuff that's not going to push the needle forward and just go ahead. I, I know it's boring. I get bored sometimes waking up at 4 a.m., especially when I, I don't I don't have a job right now. But it's good, though, because I have other sources of income that I found out in these very early hours of, of the morning because I'm resolute on helping people and I know what I want to do with life and I'm 27. And if you sign up to do something that you did, aren't passionate about now, you're you're going to take it out on uh, uh, on other people. And that's what creates a lot of discord in society. You know, people just need to learn how to be nice to other people. And I know that is a whole lot more complex than what I described. And we still haven't not figure out how to go fight wars with each other based on skin color, based on different languages, based on different ideologies and all that other stuff. But I just want to let you guys know, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good example, right? I was in a fraternity one time in West Virginia in the place where I went to college at, and that is by far the worst mistake of my life. But sometimes you have to learn 
what wrong is, but for you know what right is. And I think in this moment, I learned what proper networking was. And, you know, I was the dude that didn't fit in. I got made fun of for going to the gym and going to class for not drinking enough. I don't even drink like that right now. I'm just like, I look at myself and I wanted to smack myself in the mirror. And I'm just like, who was this person trying to fit in when I know I didn't have the money for like the fancy shoes or anything like that? I was at school just so I can, you know, get my degree, go serve in the military for a little bit. But I transferred that while I was on active duty. I was doing a lot of venture capital things while I was still working a full-time job for the military. But then I would always go back to that example. Be like, hey, am I adding value by being in this group chat or showing up to this event? Or am I being an energy drain and a social awareness waster? And you can typically tell between somebody's response time or how they talk to you or about you. So just be confident in your abilities. Be confident in what you bring to the table. And nine times out of 10, if it doesn't result in the resolute solution that you have, then you can just keep going. But um, yeah, no, that's just my closing remarks right there. Um, how about you, Daniil? Yeah, um, my closing remark uh, is that uh, uh, you have a, a serious responsibility on your shoulders, man, uh, because uh, you uh, decided to help other people. And uh, what I see uh, is that you help a lot on uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs on our community outside the community and you're sp spreading the inspiration and knowledge to others so keep going never stop so that's my advice to you and people like you are because there are plenty of people out there they may not say anything but they will be so much uh, 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 grateful for what you do uh, even though you might not have it right away it will take uh, maybe some time. However, you're doing a great job and it's important because you're being an example of why it's important of helping others. And I just want to emphasize on this uh, as my closing remark, because to me, it's so important when founders help other founders. This is how they help their own business. The reputation, network, uh, investors helping other investors. This is a mission of existence of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is not uh, uh, great just because they are rich or they have really good weather. They have these values. And uh, that's why people wanted to live in there. After this uh, crisis and cost of rent or something, people are like starting reconsidering. But I don't really get it why there is no Silicon Valley digitally in the world yet. So uh, because of people like you are maybe my some a contribution of my team, myself, we are creating this digital center. It's not for me, it's for us. So I want every single one who is listening to us, take an example of Christopher by helping not even us, but as entrepreneur, like come and ask, like, how can I be of help? How, how can I be a, a resource for you? And try to genuinely help. And then you will see so much positive response so much trust to you and they will refer to you and not and don't expect anything from them maybe not even them but maybe somebody else this paying it forward uh, thing really works yes we saw the movie we saw the concept like we heard this it sounds like a fairy tale it's really it really works so help others i encourage everyone absolutely and like i just think that's the law of reciprocity what you pour into the world you're going to give back and a lot of people look at venture capital and like you you see all the misconstruement on social media, you know, like the fancy happy hours and the, all that other stuff. Yeah, that's cool and all. But to me, I'd like to get a bed on time because I'm waking up in the morning and we're getting after it and stuff. But I think of the tiny community that I came from growing up. And since I left Maryland, there's been a lot of good startup founders and a lot of good things happening in that metropolitan area. And I'm also part South American. And in case you guys haven't heard on the news down in Argentina, shout out to Lionel Messi. He'll probably never hear this, but it's worth a shot. There's a lot of activity going on down there. Not only are you just funding an idea that could change the world, you know, you're helping energize a community, show other people what's possible, putting bread on somebody's table. And the big difference between an SMB, small business, and a startup, a uh, startup makes things that help change the world. And I think that's important. Sometimes people just need not just the capital, like you said, but the expertise of, I, I don't know, chief of science, like you're seeing in life sciences or anything like that. Venture capital is a different game because the board members, they have to provide you what's called startup operational support. And 
you know, people can burn through capital and fail, and you see that a lot. But um, yeah, uh, I guess while we still have a little bit of time, let's uh, let's chop up this whole Silicon Valley Bank incident because I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. You know, I'm never I I I didn't see that coming. And guys, to be a hundred percent honest with you, Silicon Valley Bank back when this stuff happened with my uncle in January. I uh, applied for their one of their positions in tech startup banking, you know, because I put in the interview how big my network was and it kind of opened their eyes like, oh, the army guy actually, you know, has a hold of this. But yeah, so I made it to the final interview. I think I got beat out by somebody that's been doing investment banking at Alvarez and Marsal for a while. And I am so glad that that did not work out. But uh, what's your take on that incident going on right now? This is ongoing. Well, yeah, uh, my take on this is uh, um, uh, I'm from uh, the country where the banking system failed many times and my family lost their wealth multiple times, as many uh, as many uh, most of the people uh, back in Russia when uh, everything was good in the country. Well, mm, uh, my take on this uh, is quite simple. It's horrible when uh, nobody wants to be in this uh, in their shoes and I'm really uh, hoping the guys will find a way to solve it and it seems like things are getting better because Biden administration got into this but there is positive side of this which I see or even foresee for future what will happen uh, you know when you create a product you always find bags in the system right so you're like trying to tweak bags so consider this like a, a Silicon Valley still as the product in development and Silicon Valley Bank is one of the uh, bags, uh, bugs that happens <laughs> in the system. They will fix it. They will make this system stronger, better, uh, and self-sufficient. So unlikely we'll see problems like that. We'll see other problems. And the system will crash again and again and again. But we'll see a next level problems in future. So in overall, it's a good thing. And we, we managed to find some weaknesses in the system. Now it's time to address. It, it would be very dumb not to address it. And so if we would, then the system will unlikely to crash like that again. Hopefully it will never crash again. But I mean, crisis happens every eight years and it's for good. If we identify the weak sides of what we didn't see before and fix it. Yeah, and I'm glad that you're not one of the conspiracy theorists on the internet that I actually hate when people say, oh, the end of the world's happening. It's like, no, we don't see what's going on up the treasury. We we talked about failure for a good amount of time, right? When the stakes are small here on, on the macro, yeah, you know, big mistake normally means big fallout, but that just means better correction. And imagine how many fintech startups are going to be trying to solve what little minute problems happening in the banking system. I'm going to go research that later, actually, and post it next week. But yeah, guys, um, our time is coming to a close and I really hope you enjoy on this lovely uh, Friday, just two guys just chopping it up. So, guys, with that being said, thank you for tuning in for the Go Global World podcast. And it was not five minutes today, so I'm not going to say that. But thank you so much.